I'm Peter Baldwin. Um, I'm on the uh, board of the ACLS, but I am new to it, and I've never been to one of these meetings before, so I am winging it. But the panelists are not winging it. Uh, they have been through the rigorous process of applying for and being vetted and receiving a fellowship from the ACLS. And as you all know, that's a very difficult procedure, 10 times as many applications as there are a final recipients. So they are consummate professionals, and they are the ones that we want to hear about and from today, so I'm going to be as brief as possible. You have all the information that you need about who they are in the um, materials. We're here to hear about fellowships because fellowships are, in fact, the core of what the ACLS does. We give out 300 of them or so uh, every year. As you will have seen from the financial statements, we spend something on the order of $20 million out of a total income of $28 million on fellowships. I don't mean to say that $8 million is a kind of rounding error. $8 million is what keeps the lights on at Third Avenue. $8 million is what allows the lavish hospitality that we're enjoying here. But the bulk of our efforts are giving out research grants to promising scholars to accomplish uh, the work of the future. Now, what we have here is not exactly a representative sample of those fellowships that we give out. It would be, I think, unfair to consider you representative of anything. These are three remarkable uh, fellows who are going to talk about uh, their work. I think it's more telling to regard this as a kind of Noah's Ark in the sense that it's a sampling of the vast smorgasbord of the sort of work that is done under the auspices of the, uh, of the ACLS. We have three remarkable panelists who are going to talk in this order. Um, first, Ellen um, Muehlberger, who's going to talk about attitudes uh, towards death in, uh, in Christianity in late antiquity. And then uh, Candace Taylor, who's going to talk about Afro-American tourism in the era of Jim Crow. And then finally, Lena Vercheri, who's going to talk about contemporary Buddhist practice is, is in various parts of the uh, world. So it's a sort of Noah's Ark in the sense that it's a wide sampling of different uh, approaches, but it's also a Noah's Ark in the sense that these scholars represent uh, the future. If we can get through the current inclement weather, <laughs> these are the kinds of trends of scholarship that will presumably take root uh, in the future and will guide uh, hum thought in the humanities to come. And I'm hoping that the discussion, once they've finished telling us about their work, will be guided above all by this sense of where the humanities are going and where this kind of scholarship that they're presenting uh, will take us. So without further ado, I turn it over to my panelists. Good morning. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank the ACLS board for inviting me to address you. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to speak about the influence that a fellowship from the council can have on a project. Because the scope and aim of my work changed during my year as a Charles A. Rice Camp Fellow. In the application I submitted, I proposed to study ideas about death in late ancient Christianity, and that's roughly the time period from the Emperor Constantine through to the life of the Prophet Muhammad. By working on this topic, I was joining an already vibrant conversation taking place among scholars about the death ways of the ancient world. Studies of funerary culture, for example, have already detailed ancient manners of dealing with the death of a loved one, the ritual processes around and performed for the recently deceased, the shifting locations of and permissions for burial, the elaborate complex of laborers and labor that developed to support the treatment of the newly dead, and in studies of material objects, like commemorative inscriptions or sarcophagi or grave textiles, scholars have demonstrated that late ancient Christians remembered the dead long after their passing and kept them alive, so to speak, to keep participating in their communities. These works by my colleagues in the ancient field are kin to others that focus on the modern world. And I heard during the roll call that Catherine Verdery is here. I may fangirl at you later <laughs> um, for her work on uh, the political lives of dead bodies. All of these works demonstrate death's potential to dispose how human beings act with one another. Of course, all these studies examine the responses of the living. The changes they described are located in the human community that survives the death of one of its members. 
and there are other angles to consider. In my project, I wanted to look at something that might seem ephemeral at first glance. I was curious, how do a culture's concept about death shape the life of the person who anticipates that she will die that death? More specifically for my field of study, I wanted to comprehend what late ancient Christians anticipated for their own deaths and how such a thing came to be deserving of pious attention in the first place. What I had at my disposal for investigating this topic were late ancient sermons. Those sermons I already knew had a certain tone because other historians of early Christianity have been remarking in footnotes, footnotes for a decade or so now that preaching took a dark turn in the fourth century. Preachers began to talk about death more, and when they did, it was frightening and gruesome rather than hopeful or consolatory. That turn registered across the Mediterranean world. There are examples of this kind of preaching about death that survive in Latin and Greek, but also in Syriac and Coptic and Armenian. So you can have a flavor of what I'm talking about. Here are some pieces of a sermon about judgment written by Shenuta, who lived in Upper Egypt in the fourth and fifth centuries. He describes how death will be, saying these words. You are alone and you are constricted. You are weary with the fever of the disease pressing down upon you. Exceedingly wretched, you say nonsense words. The day of death has come to you like a robber. The hour of death has seized you like a thief. You are entangled, twisted in the afflictions and tortures of fatal illness like a gazelle or a bird in a snare with no way out. Now, though you want to take a few of the things that have been prepared for you, you don't have the strength to finish them. The rattle of death muzzles your throat and your heart. Your visitors try to persuade you and they say, look, it's food, but you alone see that your strength is leaving little by little. You're angry with yourself and your heart is troubled as you think, why did I not grieve my sins with fasts and prayers? Why did I give my riches to women and my possessions to quarrels? Why did I not give my bread to the hungry person or open my warehouse to the one who lacks? What's wrong with me that I forgot to do every good work? Now, I stand up here and I read these excerpts without any visual aid, but I think at least a few of you went with me. You may have begun to imagine how it will feel to be alone and constricted and weary and feverish at death. You may have thought about what the death rattle will sound like when it's in your throat. If you have an active imagination, you might have gone a bit further, not to see just generic visitors attending you, but perhaps your very own loved ones, preparing food that you will never eat and asking questions that you will never answer. You might have invented your own regretful questions to yourself. Maybe you didn't give your riches to women or refuse to open your storehouses to the needy, but you will regret something when it comes your time to die, and maybe you thought about what that was. If so, then the rhetoric that makes up so much of late ancient preaching about death has worked on you. Think for a minute how simple it was. All the sermon had to do was to switch into second person and to offer a few details about what you felt or what you heard, and you went along. The sermon moved into first person voice to ventriloquize a few questions that you might ask yourself, and in so doing, told you that you would ask yourself regretful questions at your death. Put another way, that sermon induced an experience for you. Emotional, maybe physical, if you felt that death rattle. And with whatever tweaks that you made to your own visualization of it, personal. What if I encouraged you then to return to this experience and to relive it often, maybe even imagining it daily? Christian preachers in late antiquity did just that, asking their audiences to revisit the experience of their future deaths that they had had while listening to sermons about what that experience would be. And in this, they introduced a peculiar ethical tool to Christian culture, namely evaluating your current behavior by thinking about what you'll regret at the end of your life. Now, it's a common enough trope in American and European culture, but it was new to Christianity at the time. The earliest followers of Jesus had written about death as if it would be a moment of liberation. It was their escape from an evil and persecuting world. But it was in late antiquity that Christians first began to anticipate that death would be, for them, a moment of reckoning. Before the fellowship year, the scope of my project was just to document that development, to produce a cultural history of the Christian preaching that cultivated the habit of imagining death in this certain way. During the fellowship year, though, I had time to think, time to follow my own inventions about where this change in preaching might have come from and what its effects might have been. 
I realized in time how the habits of anticipation that I was studying could offer an answer to a very old puzzle about Christianity, and that is this. Ancient Christians very strongly identified with Jesus, who they thought was unjustly tortured and killed by a corrupt government. They also strongly identified with martyrs, persons whom they remembered as persecuted and killed on Jesus' behalf. Yet in the fifth century, Christian writers, Augustine for one of them, began to defend the use of compulsion in religion. They offered elaborate justifications of physical force when it was used to produce allegiance to their version of Christianity. Some even described their own assaults against religious opponents as acts of martyrdom. That is, I assault you because you're different and I'm the martyr. The irony is quite rich, and it's been well noted in my field, but irony is not an explanation. Noting how strange it was for ancient Christians to adopt and defend violence against others is not the same as understanding how they came to that incongruous position in the first place. During my fellowship year, I began to understand that the sensibility introduced by thinking about death as a moment of reckoning could be context for the Christian legitimization of the use of force against others. The visualization of death was necessarily an individual practice. It was your death that you were induced to think about, but it had logical implications about the nature of human beings in general. Anticipating death as the time that each person will realize the errors and sins she has committed, that each will finally and regretfully grasp the truth that she should have known all along, teaches that there is a truth that will be grasped, to which all people will eventually align. Viewed through this lens of inevitability, opponents were not the people who happened to think differently. They were willfully misguided, recalcitrant, holding out against a conclusion that they would eventually come to one way or another. It was a short step then to seeing religious deviants as people who were ripe for correction, and not just at the hour of death, but before that. Such people could be helped to avoid the difficulty and pain of that hour if they could be induced to see the truth now. Visualizing the scenario of the moment of reckoning, making a habit of anticipating death in this way, changed what Christians were willing to do to one another. In this way, my project became an example of the power of cultural tropes. The use of force to compel religious opponents to one side seems so grave a decision that it should originate from meticulous consideration or principled thought. But my work revealed that in late antiquity, justifications for force developed not from principles, but from images imagined scenarios and projections for the future. Christians learned how to anticipate death in a particular way, they nursed the habit of doing so, and it changed what they thought of human beings. That in turn changed what they thought it right and even necessary to do to other human beings. My book focuses on the ancient world, but it points out more generally how magnetic the products of our imagination can be how inexorably they pull us to accept new positions and new actions, especially when they depict a difficult and frightening future. Based on the scenarios that we create and we nurse, we rationalize what we will do, what resources we will spend or hold back, what empathies we will engage or tamp down, which principles we will hold to and which we will abandon. These are ends that reach far beyond my area of expertise, but I was given the range to explore them because of the Rice Camp Fellowship. When you fund humanities research, you are of course funding the projects as they're described in their applications, but you're also opening new and unpredictable trajectories for thought just by giving a scholar the time to think them. Thank you. Hello, I am so thrilled and honored to be here. Um, can, my slides are up, perfect. Um, thank you for the introduction, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I also wanna thank the ACLS for this phenomenal fellowship. Um, being an ACS fellow, uh, an ACLS fellow has been one of the highlights of my life and of my career. I'm a cultural documentarian, and over the last 15 years, I've traveled over 300,000 miles throughout the U.S. documenting everything from female bullfighters to diner waitresses 
to hairdressers that served all different kinds of communities, including black, Pakistani, Jamaican, Japanese, and Orthodox Jewish communities. And I stumbled onto the Green Book by accident, actually. I was at the Autry Museum in LA, and I was writing a book on Route 66, and I thought, there's got to be other stories here, because so many of the stories surrounding Route 66 were based on practically just the white male perspective. And I realized that 90% of all the people who had written books on Route 66 had been white males. So I asked different questions. I thought, well, where were the black people? Where were the women? You know, where were the Native Americans? And how did they intersect in this global icon, what Route 66 is? So when I went to the Autry Museum at a Route 66 exhibit, they had a green book tucked under glass. I'd never seen anything like it. I didn't know anything like it. It had existed. And I ran home and called my parents and said, you know, my stepfather grew up during the South, uh, during Jim Crow in the South. And I said, you know, do you know about this? You know, have you heard about it? He knew there were guides, but he didn't know about the Green Book specifically. Um, can I see a show of hands of people who actually knew about the Green Book? Great. And well, keep your hands up, but put your hands down if you just learned about it in the last few years. Yeah, it's, it's been, it, it's getting a rise in attention and it's well deserved. But for those of you who are just learning about the Green Book, it was a travel guide that was published for black people during the Jim Crow era. It was from 1936 to 1967. And it was created by this man, Victor H. Green. He was a postal worker from Harlem. He modeled his Green Book after uh, Jewish traveler guides that were published in the 30s for the Borscht Belt. And people called it a triple A for black people, but it was really so much more. You know, since blacks were shut out of nearly every segment of society, the Green Book went far beyond just the traditional food and lodging options. There were tailors and drugstores and haberdashers and even real estate offices listed. Uh, sanitariums. Disneyland was in the Green Book. And this was the reality that black people were dealing with. The climate of race relations was very extreme. This was actually posted in the Chicago Tribune editorial. And I'm just going to paraphrase, but it essentially says, you know, if you are black, because you're such an irritation to white people, it would be best if you just stayed away from recreational spaces altogether um, because your presence is resented. And in 1937, when the Green Book started publications, you know, blacks couldn't eat, sleep, drink, or even get gas in most white owned businesses. And so to avoid the humili humiliation of being turned away, they traveled with portable toilets, bedding, gas cans, even Coca-Cola had white customers only printed on it. And also the Green Book was right, you know, in the middle of the second wave of the black migration was underway. So blacks who traveled north quickly learned that although the Jim Crow signs of the south, they didn't see as many of those, but they quickly learned that Racial discrimination was rampant throughout the country. There were thousands of sundown towns, which were all white communities that banned blacks within city limits after dark. Some towns rang a bell at 6 p.m. telling them it's time to go. Um, if you weren't from that area, you didn't know. Um, there was a sign posted at the county line saying, you know, nigger don't let the sun go down on you here. So it was very serious. James Lowen actually wrote a book, he's a sociologist out of Harvard, uh, a book called Sundown Towns, if you wanna learn more about that. This is a sundown town actually in Oklahoma. Um, the Royce Cafe, this is their postcard, and right on it, the cover of the postcard says, you know, a good place to live, no Negroes. Fantastic Caverns was a Route 66, and it still is a major Route 66 uh, tourist site. It's a drive-through cave. It's got this kitschy feature. You can drive through it, but during this time, the KKK actually ran Fantastic Caverns, and they had cross burnings inside of the Grand 
area. So you needed a green book. You needed something to help you understand where you could be and where you shouldn't be. Um, and it, it said right on the cover, you know, always carry your green book with you because you may need it. And yet despite all of these dangers, black people jumped in their cars and took road trips. The courage and resilience it must have taken to just go anyway, I think is so inspirational and it's what's carried me through this project. I'm also tremendously inspired by the Green Book sites that are still standing. And support from the ACLS is allowing me to locate and document these sites all over the United States. They range from modest tourist homes to lonely nightclubs to lavish hotels. The fact that we still have these buildings as physical evidence of racial discrimination is a rich opportunity to re-examine America's troubled history with segregation, black migration, and the rise of the black leisure class. There's roughly about 10,000 businesses that were listed in the Green Book during its entire tenure. And most of these businesses were owned by black people, which was a powerful display of black entrepreneurship. And I think they play a critical role in revealing an untold story of not just the African-American experience, but of the American experience. They represent the struggle uh, and the triumph of finding a warm meal and a safe place to rest. This place is just less than two miles of, of the uh, Mexico-US uh, border in Douglas, Arizona. And one of my favorite Green Book sites is the Dunbar Hotel. It was built in 1928 by a man named John Alexander Somerville. It was reportedly the first black hotel. It was built expressly for black people. And it was fancy. They called it the Waldorf Astoria of black America. And it became the social and cultural hub of black intelligentsia serving W.E.B. Du Bois, Cab Calloway, Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Louis Armstrong, and Ella Fitzgerald were regulars. And this is another one, Murray's Dude Ranch. Um, it's one of the most unusual Green Book sites I've come across. It was billed as the only Negro Dude Ranch in the world, and it probably was. Um, <laughs> It was a 40-acre ranch that sat right on the edge of the Mojave Desert. Black and white celebrities were regulars. Uh, Joe Lewis, the boxer, brought his entourage. Lena Horne had a hopper. Clara Bow were regulars. Pearl Bailey bought the property in the 1960s. Um, actually, she bought it in 1955, and she sold it in the 1960s. But what makes Murray so special is that it was one of the first integrated places where black and white children could swim together. And this was unheard of, even in California. You know, Santa Monica, the beaches were segregated. Uh, the West was no different or more liberated, um, even though it has that reputation now. Um, but as I said, Jim Crow was in full force throughout the country. So Murray's was a special place, but this is all that's left today. There's no physical evidence that Murray's ever existed. Clifton's Cafeteria is another one. Uh, it's located, it's a, actually a cafeteria in downtown Los Angeles. It was owned by a man named Clifford Clinton. He was an incredible humanitarian. He had seen abject poverty. He had traveled to China with his parents as a missionary. And he couldn't believe that America, a country so wealthy, could allow its citizens to go hungry. So when he opened his restaurant, he made a pledge that he was never going to turn anyone away because of lack of funds. And he sold, this was a depression era restaurant, and he sold five cent meals, he gave away food, and he still managed to make a profit. And I think we can learn a lot from Clifford Clinton, and I hope he's an inspiration to other business owners today. In 2011, uh, Clifton's went under a $10 million renovation. It just reopened in 2015. It's possibly the largest and most unusual cafeteria in the country. It's got five floors, a fake redwood tree rising through the center. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's fabulous. And here we are in Baltimore. You know, although some Green Book sites have been resurrected and made into these incredible spaces, the truth is most of them are gone. Uh, less than 5% of Green Book properties are still standing. 
And for example, my last trip, uh, when I moved from LA to New York to do a fellowship at the Schomburg, um, I scouted over 900 green book sites and only about 26 were still in operation. So it's very rare that you see them. And it's, so it's very exciting when I do come across them. And even this one here in Baltimore, uh, you know, that's one thing that I learned is that many are in really abject, impoverished, abject poverty neighborhoods. I mean, the Wonderland Bar here is, um, it looks condemned, but it's actually open for business. I saw somebody coming out. Uh, the neon sign, I don't know if you can see that's still on. Um, and this is just how some of our communities look. And of course, we're at the waterfront where it's beautiful here, and you would never know about five miles down the road, this is what's how other Americans are living. And once I started mapping Green Book listings, it became evident that they were clustered in traditionally black neighborhoods. Um, when I was scouting Chicago's South Side, you know, being a cultural documentarian, I'm, I am in the field. And um, when I was scouting uh, Green Book sites in Chicago, there was a neighborhood where 53 people had been shot that weekend. Not that month, that weekend. And I was too afraid to even get out of my car to use a bathroom, but I have a coffee habit, so I really had to, to pee. And um, I thought, this is really ironic, you know? I'm a black woman living in 2017, and um, this was once an area that was a safe zone for black people, and now has essentially become a war zone. And I did get out of my car. I realized I don't live here. I couldn't imagine having to make those decisions every day, living in a neighborhood um, that has just been pretty much abandoned and neglected um, by, our, by our government. And I haven't been, you know, so it's been interesting doing this project. I mean, I ha I, since I started doing this project, I've carried mace and a stun gun. I've been um, lunged at by mentally ill people. I haven't been physically attacked. I've been chased by dogs. Um, but, uh, but I'm still here to tell the story, so I'm grateful. So, you know, Victor Green believed once that segregation ended, uh, there would be no need for his guide. And although we want to believe that the passage of the Civil Rights Act fixed racism, we know that we know better. Um, it, racism continued to shape America's social, political, and physical spaces. Blacks were blocked from the GI Bill. The Federal Housing Association denied funding to blacks, uh, preventing them from accessing wealth building opportunities that were just freely given to whites. The US government continued redlining neighborhoods and legislated aggressive, harmful policing policies such as law and order and stop and frisk which has led to the incarceration of nearly one in three black men in America today. And we are seeing even uh, widespread discrimination in companies like Airbnb and Uber. And this isn't based on anecdotal evidence. Uh, There's a comprehensive study out of Harvard that found clear evidence of racial discrimination against black Airbnb customers. Um, they were actually being arrested for breaking into their rentals because white neighbors would call and say some, there's a black person breaking into the house next door and hence they would come and get arrested. Um, so in response to this, there are these websites, no Airbnb, that are kind of a black Airbnb that are cropping up to serve, to serve black people. And this isn't to say that Airbnb is racist, you know. I, they are horrified that this is happening. This is not their fault. Um, but to create a business model, I, I'm surprised that they didn't see this coming. Um, because to create a business model where you're inviting people in your most intimate spaces, and obviously those, it triggers those base fears of you know, otherness. Um, you have to screen and vet people to, into your home. It's just a recipe for stereotyping. So as a society, we still have a lot of work to do which is why I'm so thankful that I get to do this project um, to bring the Green Book out of the past and represent it in the current cultural paradigm of race, poverty, and social mobility. I'm creating a book, a traveling exhibit, a board game, and an interactive digitized map 
The map will trace the history of physical and social mobility of blacks. In America, it will ultimately examine what does equality really look like. It will include migratory routes from the Underground Railroad to the Great Migration. Green Book sites will be mapped along with lynching sites, sundown towns, and current KKK chapters. So it'll be at the exhibit and online, it'll have this feature where you can actually type in your zip code and see maybe if you were raised in a sundown town or near a sundown town and didn't know it. It'll show what hate groups are currently in your neighborhood that you may not know about. Um, I'm in talks with the Smithsonian right now about developing this traveling exhibition. It'll be a 3,000 square foot exhibit that will travel the US for about three to five years. And the book will provide new research and documentation, historical narratives, and statistical data regarding Green Book properties. I'll employ qualitative and quantitative methodologies to analyze and catalog Green Book related materials and ephemera, including advertisements, ledgers, menus, sign-in sheets, and marketing materials. And I'm also developing a mobile app. Um, it's exciting news, just yesterday we're looking at partnering with Harvard for this. Um, and I will work with city officials, historic preservation committees to develop the tour. I've already started working with the LA city planner to begin the process of designating green book sites as cultural heritage sites. And my ultimate dream is that the walking tour will bring historic and cultural values to these communities, those that are struggling and those that are thriving. This one in Harlem uh, is a community that's thriving. But the program would also employ local residents, teenagers, and former inmates to do everything from rehabbing and building these buildings to staffing green book sites. Um, it will create jobs for those who otherwise would have few employment opportunities. So in conclusion, I would like to, to again thank the ACLS for this prestigious fellowship and for supporting this project and allowing me to continue to do this work. If you would like to follow the project, uh, my email address is right there. You can take a note or come and talk to me. I'll give you my card. And I'll add you to my updates list. I send about four out a year, um, just letting you know what's happening with the project. But I'd like to thank you so much for your time and attention today. Hi, everyone. All right, so I have a PowerPoint. Uh, my name is Lena Vercherie. I am a doctoral candidate in the study of religion at Harvard University. I focus on the study of contemporary Chinese Buddhism. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's really exciting to hear about these other projects and have the chance to share a few thoughts. So um, we kind of got an email earlier and we were um, encouraged to speak about a couple or touch on a couple issues. Um, but first, before getting to those issues about our own sort of intellectual motivations and research methods, I wanted to just give you a quick little debrief on uh, what I'm working on. Um, so my dissertation is about contemporary Buddhist monastic life. It's an eth ethnographic case study of a modern, uh, very conservative um, international uh, monastic organization called Fajie, Fajie for Jiao Zhonghui. I'll just say Fajie for short. Um, this uh, is an international organization active throughout the Chinese diaspora that was founded um, by a monk from northeastern China, from Manchuria actually, called Xuanhua Shangren. Um, and uh, like many of his contemporaries, he fled uh, communist China in the late 1940s, which explains why his organization today is so active in the Chinese diaspora. So one contour of my analysis is looking at how Fajie understands itself as operating within the conditions of modernity, but still holds fast to its traditionalist, um, or some people might use this very fraught word, fundamentalist, or perhaps literalist beliefs, uh, worldviews, um, and especially with uh, regard to the Buddhist ideas of karma, uh, Buddhist ideas of rebirth, and Buddhist hells. 
Now these are big issues, um, but the way that I'm kind of delving into them is through a, a small sort of narrow window that I discovered in my fieldwork. My fieldwork, by the way, um, I've started, you know, I started fieldwork with this organization in uh, 2010. So I've been at it for several years, going for a few months at a time, but thanks to the grant I got through ACLS and the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, I was able to last academic year to spend a full 10 months doing fieldwork, um, basically living at the monastery um, and uh, following the monastic schedule and spending a lot of time with the, the trainees and the nuns. This is in uh, Taiwan. So I'm looking at how these big issues like karma and reincarnation play out in daily life. And the lens through which I'm doing this is looking at the role of non-human agents. Um, you know, because it would be uh, really inaccurate, actually, to say that Buddhists understand the monastic community to be limited to human beings. Because actually, the monastic community actively engages a variety of non-human uh, agents. Not only animals, but also kinds of, you know, invisible uh, creatures. Um, and What's interesting is that they incorporate this not just in the kind of ritual or symbolic ways you might expect, but actually in very um, mundane, kind of ordinary, pragmatic aspects of daily life. So this can, um, of course, is not limited, let's say, to the Buddhist vegetarian or vegan diet, of course, but actually can include things like leaving formal eviction notices to the kitchen mice before it's time to clean. <laughs> or, for example, uh, formal written warnings on the trees before you go um, to do any kind of pruning work, to warn the invisible organisms or um, you know, spiritual beings that live in the tree that you're about to come mess with their home. And actually, depending on how much work you're going to do on the tree, the, you know, the rule is that they need seven to 14 days advanced warning. Um, it's, it's totally serious. Or, um, you know, another example is the way that the animals that live at the monastery, of which there are many, um, are also held to certain standards of spiritual and moral cultivation. Standards that we might say, oh, well, this might be reasonable for a human to aspire to. But standards that might strike some of us in this room if we kind of assume a certain difference between human and animal beings might strike us as totally unreasonable uh, for animals. But, you know, I'm struck by the conversation, some of these earlier ideas about what Ellen was talking about, and last night's conversation, the panel, where there was mention of the moral imagination. Well, here we see the moral imagination at work, actually. Um, and I think it's important, you know, not just to sort of use this question in hindsight and say, how did people in the past lack moral imagination, slaveholders not recognizing the full humanity of slaves, but also how might we be seen to be lacking in moral imagination by the Buddhist monks and nuns who say, how is it that these people can't recognize animals, for example, as being fully sentient beings? So sometimes you have to turn the question back on yourself. Okay. So let me just sum up by saying that um, one of the great discoveries in my fieldwork was that at the Buddhist monastery, the goal, actually, people don't really talk so much about reaching enlightenment, right? This surprised me. What they talk about is learning to be human, how to become human. And so my research question is saying, why is it that what it means to be human is so often mediated by engagement with non-human beings. What is it about the non-human that teaches us what the human is? Okay, so that's my dissertation. The other thing I do is, is I make films. Um, so I've worked in documentary and various kinds of um, educational and experimental film um, stuff for television and other kinds of distribution. Um, and some of these works have actually uh, had some kind of overlap with yeah, some overlap with my academic interests. So for example, this is a short film I did called The Outdoor Church about a group of homeless men and women in Cambridge, Massachusetts that just get together every Sunday and, and do church out in a subway station. Uh, a documentary short called The Trap about lobster fishermen in Canada and their nearby neighbors, Buddhist monastics who practice the ritual of liberating life. This is where they actually purchase the live lobsters from the fishermen and return them to the ocean. 
Um, this is a short film I made uh, in the very early years of my fieldwork, actually, with Fajia nuns, following them on pilgrimage through the Rocky Mountains of Canada, where they were actually going to a mountain that they have identified as a Buddhist sacred site, so a Buddhist sacred mountain in Canada. Okay, so that's a bit about my work, but let me now just kind of open into some broader questions for today. Um, and let me touch on these two very specific kind of questions that Steve had asked us to talk, talk about a little bit, dealing with what are our intellectual motivations for our research and what are some of our research methods. And actually, here I really just want to talk about one idea that I think touches on both of those questions, and this is this notion of communicating across boundaries. So there are different ways, of course, that we can think about boundaries, different levels at which we can conceptualize boundaries at work. But here I just want to talk about three ways in which we might imagine this working and three ways that have resonated for me personally. But actually first, I should say that really this idea of communicating across boundaries for me is really the primary way in which academic life and filmmaking are similar. Because really, no matter what your area of specialization is, right, academically, or what your film topic is, uh, at its most foundational, our task is to communicate ideas to an audience in a way that they can connect to, right? And in so doing, to also convince them that these ideas matter. Um, and not actually that they just matter, but that they matter to them. Um, as I think both of our presenters already have really done very effectively, that it matters to you, taking up the second person, like we heard Ellen talking about. Okay, so let me um, touch on three ways I think this, this, uh, this resonates for me. So the first is the most narrow way, communicating across boundaries, in the most narrow way. This is the disciplinary level. This is where I, for my own kind of discipline of Buddhist studies, this is where I feel that the study of Buddhism has to move beyond just the study of Buddhology, right? That has traditionally been um, focused primarily on philology, on translation, on the study of doctrine and scripture, and move into the humanities more broadly. So one way that we can talk about this is to say that Buddhism is not just for Buddhist studies. Right. Um, this is an idea that not everyone agrees with. In fact, some people in Buddhist studies don't even agree with this idea. But I think it could be a corrective to the kind of area studies approach, right, where so often the relevance of Asian religion, Asian philosophy, is relegated to a kind of geographically bounded or culturally bounded place. Right, so I'm saying that if we study Descartes and Bishop Berkeley in a philosophy department rather than a Euro European studies department, then we should also study Buddhist philosophy in a philosophy department. And I think that this would um, make the humanities richer. Okay, so one level, the level of discipline. Um, let me just say that you know, in my own work, uh, this commitment to kind of making Buddhism uh, speak beyond Buddhist studies has led me to incorporate um, sort of a, a vaster range of methodological approaches. I draw on anthropology, I do ethnography, I bring in film. But one of the things to say is that for people at my level, you know, kind of about to go on the job market, there is a sense that the more interdisciplinary you are, the more risk you're taking on. There's a sense that people don't want to hire anyone who kind of doesn't fit squarely in the box of what the discipline has been historically. And so in some sense, there's a kind of reluctance to, to allow your work to engage you know, um, discussions that push the boundaries of your discipline. So um, whether that is simply a perception or whether that truly is the case, I can, I can speak from my experience and say that it's something that I and my you know, colleagues um, finishing up graduate school think about a lot. Okay, so let's talk about the next level. Um, this is to think about how communicating across boundaries works on the broader level of the humanities, more generally. Okay, so if earlier we said that Buddhism is not just for Buddhist studies, then I think here we have to say that the humanities are not just for the academy. Um, and this is something that actually I have most powerfully experienced uh, through my films. Um, so, for example, The Trap, the documentary about the lobster fishermen and the Buddhist monastics in Canada. 
people sometimes go see that film um, just because, let's say, they're interested in meditation. But they come away from the film, you know, not just knowing something about meditation, but having learned something about Buddhism, you know. And for me, the most gratifying aspect of this uh, is that people who would never feel comfortable setting foot inside a university classroom or people who would actually never have the opportunity to set foot inside a university classroom can easily find this film and learn something from it. Okay, so um, I've mentioned disciplinary boundaries, looking at boundaries of the academy itself, and now I'd like to just give a third and final example of, um, of how we might think about this idea of crossing boundaries, communicating across boundaries. So I think many disciplines um, draw a kind of implicit distinction between their researchers and their objects of study. And I can say that in the study of religion, this is especially pronounced um, for obvious reasons, right? We draw a distinction between religious people, those we study with their kind of faith commitments, and then researchers on the outside, you know, who don't share those faith commitments, who can be somewhat more neutral, right? And I think this is also a boundary that we need to challenge in many respects. So here what that might look like is instead of saying, oh, I learn about Buddhism, is saying I learn from Buddhism. And actually that you don't even have to be a Buddhist to be able to do that. Um, so let me just give one example of how that has played out for me. Um, actually, this is a foundational doctrinal principle in Buddhism that has really come to actually transform my entire um, sort of pedagogical approach and the whole way that I think about doing research. This doctrine is called the doctrine of skillful means, okay? Feng bian in Chinese or upaya in Sanskrit. And what, what skillful means, what this doctrine is about, is actually not about what uh, the Buddha taught. It's about how the Buddha taught. So um, the Buddha, here, here he is in the middle. The Buddha, we know, right, was a fully enlightened, omniscient, omnipotent being. But the rest of us are not. I don't know about those in this room, but probably not, right? So the rest of us are not. So when the Buddha was teaching, um, he didn't reveal everything all at once. Really, he actually just revealed the pieces of his teaching that were appropriate, that were needed, that could be understood by his audience at that time in that particular place. And so that kind of selectivity is what's called using skillful means. So um, this is actually traditionally expressed through all sorts of wonderful metaphors. Like we arrive in Baltimore yesterday and it's pouring rain. Well, one of the wonderful metaphors for skillful means is that it's like the rain that falls on a meadow of different plants. And every plant can absorb just what they need. So the tree can take in a lot of water and the individual little blade of grass can just take in a little bit. Or um, a beautiful idea of how when the Buddha would speak to his audience, his audience was coming from all sorts of different regions in the Indian subcontinent. Everyone spoke a different dialect. But a special property of the Buddha's speech is that when he would speak, everyone heard what he was saying in their mother tongue. They could hear it in their mother tongue. And so what this is saying, and this is exactly what the doctrine of skillful means is, is that the Buddha wasn't saying, you have to come to my level, you have to learn my language. He went to them. Right? And this, I think, is actually more than saying, oh, the Buddha was, you know, a nice guy. This is a strong ethical imperative that's relevant for us, which is to say that from a Buddhist doctrinal perspective, how you communicate is as important as what you communicate. And this is to say that the act of communication itself, which in Buddhist jargon would be called sort of a compassionate act, this idea of connecting meaningfully with another being, that the act of communication itself is actually a moral virtue. And if you ask me, this is what the humanities does. Um, it's not only the what of our research that makes it so vital. Um, one of the greatest things we can contribute, I think, is how the humanities can model 
the how. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much. How does it work with the microphone? Do these, can you hear us? Good. Um, thank you, colleagues, for those absolutely fascinating uh, talks, uh, very rich and, um, and intriguing. I think I'm going to take the chair's prerogative of hogging the microphone uh, to start with, um, not to ask a question, but just, if I may, a, a very sort of brief comment on, on what we've heard. We're all in the business of pattern recognition. If you do it just the right amount, it's considered an insight. If you do too much pattern recognition, you're a conspiracy <laughs> theorist or you're mad. And given sort of the extraordinary diversity of the things that we've been hearing here, of course, to go looking for a pattern, you know, subjects you to the possibility of trying too hard. But it seems to me that there actually is, as I was listening to these, there is a pattern here that goes to the core of what it is the humanities are about. And that is that fundamentally what all three panelists were talking about was the process of really two things. One, understanding something that is totally different. In fact, something that you only discover is different by virtue of study. Ellen, that was sort of your discovery. The Christians sort of, it's almost like invasion of the body snatchers. They become something different in the process of understanding what in fact their, 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 the logic of persecution that grows out of the claim to know uh, the truth. And it's also about understanding realities that we didn't no, we're there. These are parallel universes. The parallel universe that was seen only by black tourists or black motorists, or voyagers, um, and the parallel universe of Buddhists warning the trees and, and living in a world that we don't even know is there until we, or you, go and look at it. So with that, um, let me shut up and turn the discussion over to the floor if anyone would like to comment, question, otherwise intervene. The microphones are out there, I believe. Hi, um, I'm Judy Byfield, and I just really want to commend each presenter. Those were fabulous projects, and I'm so glad that you got the support that you needed to complete these projects. Um, one of the things that I, I want to just comment on um, Candice's project is that part of the value that I see in it too is both the, the intellectual work, the cultural documentation, but how you also extended it into areas around community development, um, jobs, uh, thinking about um, people who are coming out of incarceration. So it also touches on these policy issues in ways that m so many um, people don't. And I think that's part of the richness of what you're doing here. So yes, we will have the cultural documentation, your photos, but then it really is transformative in people's lives and in the lives of these communities. And I really commend you for being able to think so expansively with this. Thank you very much. Um, should I respond? Or? Sure. Okay. Um, thank you very much because it, I do think that's important um, that we all engage in some way in this history because we are, we've benefited or been affected by it or been hurt by it in some way, all of us in this room. So I think it's a great way to, like I said, bring this out of, you know, when I, so many people who've, when they hear about this project, they say, oh, thank God we don't need that anymore. You know, the green book, thank God that's over. And, um, and I think for me, it became very clear that I need to find a way to show that this is really still with us and, um, and it's, it's not that hard to, to show that because there's so much disparity right now and intensity in our, in our culture. Um, but yes, I, you know, I do hope that uh, in a few years when the project, 2019 will be when the book and the exhibit are traveling. And when the ex exhibit's traveling, you will be able to type in, like I said, your zip code and find this information. But hopefully that we're working on um, a process where you can actually see what representatives are on the right side of this issue. And so before you leave the exhibit or before you turn off your computer, you can press one button and it will automatically send that information to your representatives. So we're working on that, but um, 
keep following the project. And thank you for your comments. I really appreciate the support. I have a, this sort of follows up. I was really thinking in Ellen's presentation you know, analyzing how that dynamic worked, projecting the future, we can save you from it, whether or not you want to be saved. The, the, the question I have is, where is the, what's the mix between sort of scholarship and advocacy? Because it would be really tempting for me, with your work, Ellen, to say, and look how this is relevant right now. Uh, which maybe, is, and certainly Candace, you, you, you've talked, Candace, you've talked exactly about that. And, and even with the Buddhists. So there's always that invidious binary between pure scholarship and advocacy. And yet it seems in all three of these projects, there's a kind of welcome mix. So I'd be curious to hear comments. You're picking up on something that has, um has been a part of the way that I've thought about this project, though I make a distinction between seeing for myself themes in contemporary culture where we project, say, the future of a young child and we decide how we'll treat him based on what we project for him, um, and my own expertise. I mean, I'm a historian of the ancient world. There are ethical and scholarly conversations about contemporary racism, classism, um, sexism that I don't know much about. And so I'm always interested in those conversations, but I also find that I have for myself a certain boundary of here is where I can listen to other people and here's where I can contribute. And my contributions tend to be about the ancient world. That's not to say that I don't encourage my students especially to think in those directions, but I feel like as a scholar, it's very easy, particularly for some reason if you do early Christianity, that seems to give people a sense of trusting you to make pronouncements in a very wide, I mean, I can, I won't name names, but several people in my field do this sort of thing. And I, I recoil from that because there are other better scholars who are more well-versed about how the modern world works in that way. I'm just noticing in a, in a culture that is not foundational for all of us, but that informs particularly American civic religion, there is this moment where we think, ah, I know what your future is, now let me help you avoid it. And that, that move is insidious. And if I can point it out in the small culture that I study, I hope I can at least get my students and perhaps readers to look for it in whatever culture they're working with and or studying. Interesting. Um, thank you very much. I'm Suzanne Blier from the College Art Association. And these are really three stunning papers. And as somebody who did not get an ACLS grant this year, Having had one previously, I think you've made really dis stunning decisions. <laughs> but let me say that I think that the issue of agency and public policy around these various concerns are absolutely critical. And in the life of my career, I haven't seen the academy at the point where it is and our role in it. And um, you know, in many respects, what we're talking about is public policy going to local boards and, and um, pressing them to support preservation of key buildings. And that's where I've found myself on my own campus and getting faculty to write letters to the undergraduate newspaper, um, putting together petitions, going to city council meetings, week after week, and there is, and as a matter of fact, there's been articles in, in the Crimson about faculty have gotten engaged, and it's a, it's a delicate balance. I really try not to bring in my students, although it was a student who got me active in the first place. Um, and um, as a result of a decision and a letter that we wrote as College Art Association that I um, engaged um, around in this paper, I've also gotten on one of those hate lists. Mm. But I think it's important, and I think that for the humanities to go public with care and with thought at this moment in time is also to say that the humanities are not simply a soft field in which people are working in isolation on issues that many people do not think are critical to the, to the society as a whole. 
And so I think that this is just an extraordinary turn, I think, for all of us, and speaks to the ways in which I'm an architectural historian in part, the ways that architectural history and other fields really can speak to the future of our communities and how together, really together, moving outside that huge amount of time it takes in an isolated room to write a book, but the pleasure that we can get from this much more broad and, and vocal engagement. No one else interested? Hmm. Something in the back? Yeah, I had a question for Candace. I was struck by uh, your mention that there had been a similar book for the Jewish community in the Catskills. And I was wondering if in your research you found that um, Jewish businesses were more open to accepting black people as clients. Um, than were other white-owned businesses, or if, if that's not the case. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have been, you know, I was at doing a fellowship at the Schomburg, and so we were really looking at examples of some of the books maybe Victor Green had been looking at in the 30s, uh, that, you know, because this was inspired by Jewish traveler guides. And it's interesting because it's not until the 60s that we start seeing more businesses that were owned by whites and Jews that um, were listed in the Green Book. So that's really all we have to go on. Um, as I said, there's approximately 10,000 businesses right now. So my catalog list, I've cataloged about 6,300. And um, so I have a research team looking at these to find more data um, about the people who ran these, you know, green book businesses. The majority of them were black. Um, but at this point, it seems to be consistent with uh, most, of the, most of the statistical data regarding, um, you know, the generosity and spirit of Jewish culture in terms of accepting blacks. It's about the same um, in regard to, uh, but you, know, but, you know, there's another layer to that that's difficult to notice because there's so many different names that, you know, Jewish names that were not, during that time, people changed their names. So we really don't have an accurate reading of what that is. But, you know, hopefully with my research team, we'll get closer to actually having statistical data around Green Book property owners. But, um, yeah, thank you for the question. German Jews in the 1930s looked to American blacks and their organizational abilities when they tried to deal with anti-Semitism, so there, yeah. there are not lots of. I really can't, there seems to be some motion down here. So um, I'm an acting delegate for the Economic History Association and I teach in a department of economics and I guess there's some issue about whether economics is humanistic or not. And so I'm, I was actually struck in the, in the, in, in the first presentation, and I, I've been struck before in looking at, at um, notions of, of transition uh, from, from life to, to the afterlife. There are concepts such as redemption and reckoning that actually have very clear analogies. I'm not sure who's analogizing what, but with, with business and economic concepts. And I don't know if that's anachronistic or not, but I was wondering if the first speaker could, could talk about that, that dimension of it. Because there really do seem to be these, these parallels with, uh, between concepts of death and you know, redemption and so on. Mm. The first speaker. Yeah. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Well, as you were talking, actually, I, I don't mean to dodge the question, but I was actually thinking about how what you're saying applies to Lena's presentation. Because if you think about the community that she's studying, they're engaging with all sorts of non-human non -human people, non-human agents or actors, but the way that they choose to engage with them is through work permits. Mm -hmm. Through an economic model of, you have a certain responsibility over this set of properties, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do to your property before that. And you think in a different culture or a different time, the type of communication might have been through letters or um, through prayers. But it's fascinating to me that they took on the, the economic model and made it the way of communicating with these other people. 
I don't know if you want to say more about that. But. Um, why don't you answer from your own kind of perspective? Remind me. <laughs> I, I want to hear it. Remind me of your question. Forgive me. I was thinking so much about this that I lost the. Yeah. Well, in, in particular, concepts such as reckoning and redemption right. seem to have an economic content to it. And actually, I, since I have the microphone, I was struck when I was in Taiwan visiting Buddhist temples. There's, there seemed to be this. Um, people there doing this sort of bargaining, you know, buying things with, with a sense of getting something in exchange as well. So it seems to be part of Buddhist practice in Taiwan as well. The I mean, sort of utilitarian dimension to religion. And part of what the sermons that I studied were doing were making up a set of ledgers. You know, they, they were thinking about people as having a chronology of responsibility and over that chronology you're incurring debts or paying things off as time goes on. This is also the time period when Western Christianity begins to invent a um, system of purgatory. They don't yet call it that, but this is the beginning of that system. Um, it's interesting to me to think about how much of economic behavior and how much of maybe moral or pietistic behavior is based around future expectations. You know, we think, um, the Susan Alcock, who has probably been involved with the society at some point, wrote a book in the early 2000s about how each ancient society has its own past and I'd like, if this project worked out the right way, to make the point that each ancient society and each society has its own future, too. And we're all imagining that future in various ways and acting, hopefully, to get to whatever we want in that future. Um, this is a room full of people who have all been very good about imagining the future and taking steps to get where they want. We're all successful academics, right, or successful scholars, successful writers. It takes a very strange skill to get there, that is picturing a future accurately and or a future that um, leads you to act in ways that will be successful in the immediate future, um, which is, when you think about it, a very weird human behavior. We don't not all of us do it, not all of us do it well, but in our society, that is the primary thing that you have to do to be quote unquote successful. And it's a strange decision for us to have made to think what makes a successful person is accurately imagining the consequences of one's actions. It's weird. So I, that may have gotten a little bit off of the economic topic, but I think that both economic success, you know, saving, accumulating wealth, all these sorts of things depend on that imagination um, mm -hmm. In a certain way, religious piety or allegiance also depends on that imagination. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great. Uh, thank you uh, to all of you. It's Gregory Schaefer, University of California, Irvine. Um, it's just a comment and a question, and these are very powerful presentations. It's really to candidacy, sort of the focus, which is one, we speak today about, we hear a lot in terms of the trope alternative facts, but African Americans have known that there's been alternative facts in terms of the way Americans see their own history that goes way back in time. So there's nothing new here. And, and so the past is present with us today. And I was wondering in terms of your part of your project, are you in ter we have, we often see placards and buildings in terms of our heritage in terms to make our historical memory that shapes how we view our past today. Is it a part of your project to p potentially put and recognize these facilities around the country with placards so that when we walk past them or we see them, we see them as emblems of something which was important in their time and important to recognize today? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, exactly what you're saying, I think, is why that it's important how I build the mobile app and um, how people engage with this history. Because obviously, I, I did get a Graham Foundation award a couple years ago to document, um, it was an architecture grant to document the actual buildings. But how do you bring this history to life? And one thing that we're looking at. Um, with uh, the partnership with Harvard is to develop an augmented reality feature um, with a mobile app so that you can put your smartphone or tablet or whatever in front of the building and it will show exactly what it looked like then. And it will take you to many different menus of understanding you know, historical facts and other, any other ephemera things that we can gather to kind of fully flesh out that narrative. Um, but I'm also very, very inspired by Brian Stevenson's work because he is doing um, essentially what you're talking about. It's, you know, instead of sanitizing our history or retelling it, 
alternative fact. Um, you know, he's developing a project on lynching sites where there will be actual um, markers. Um, so I think, you know, there's other really incredible scholars and writers that are engaging with this material. And I think now, thankfully, as a society, we're ready to learn our real history. So it's really good timing. Um, but in terms of the Green Book sites, and you know, I, I looked at having them registered on the National Historic Registrar and all of that. And when I went through that process, it just seemed very um, limiting in terms of not just having the plaque, because we see plaques, right? And some people just kind of gaze. So, how rarely are they really read and taken to our into our hearts? So, and also for the business owners, it makes it very difficult for them to maintain that business. If it's a National Historic Registrar, it's more expensive. So I didn't want to limit the business owners in that way. So finding that balance of, you know, how do we really retell history in a way that's compelling and exciting? And I think using, you know, Virtual media is, is one way that we're looking at it. Thank you. OK, one, one final question, I think, as well. Uh, yes, uh, Chris Reynolds from University of California, Davis. Um, the notion of that how you communicate is as important as what you communicate is wonderful. Uh, and I want, since two of you, at least, are involved in writing and film making, um, and you're speaking to a room of people who I'm guessing, like me, are mostly writers. Could you talk a little bit about what your thought processes are in what you decide to write about as opposed to what you decide to film? Um, I know that this thought applies equally to both, but probably in different ways. And I, so I'm curious your thoughts about that. Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, there's so much you could kind of get into with that. But um, in some ways, I mean, you know, anyone who's a writer, which I think includes probably everyone in this room, um, you're always sort of dealing with the relationship of content and form. You know, uh, that is at work in writing as well as any language that you take up, whether it's filmmaking or virtual reality or whatever it is, a museum exhibit. Um, and so, uh, I think kind of having an intuitive sense of how those two things work together and what's, what's the most um, efficacious way to deliver a message uh, is, is what I rely on. But I mean, one, one piece is kind of like, let's say the first issue I discussed about sort of the disciplinary boundaries of Buddhist studies. Um, you know, there's tremendous richness we can get from diving deep into our scriptures and our textual sources. But a lot of people forget that there's actually Buddhists in the world and that Buddhism is a real thing that exists. And so um, sometimes you can do that actually through showing, you know, th through filmic images so much more powerfully than you can through the written word. And I also think that part of it is just where we are as a society with technology and iPhones. People are always looking at visual and filmic content. This is like the language of the moment. There was the printing press, and now we have iPhones, you know? And so trying to harness harness that language and, and use it to um, tell the same stories, but tell them in a different language, I think is really um, the task that we are, that we're handed right now. Maybe, can I see? Uh, just a quick comment. Um, you know, I have a master's degree in visual criticism. And it was the first year, I think got it in 2002. So it was the first year before the visual and critical studies uh, department started to take hold. And I have to say that is really the, that was a saving grace for me as an artist um, because my undergraduate degree was in painting and drawing and I was a scenic painter for film and television before I started doing this work, before I started writing. My first book um, had uh, 60,000 words of text and like over 150 photographs. But it was the first year I'd picked up a camera because I figured it, Having a vi my visual criticism degree is from the California College of the Arts, and um, it really liberated me from being a painter. And I read a lot of theory, and I had to really focus on the concept. You know what I really wanted to say. That was more important than the ha than how I was going to say it in terms of the media. The media came later. Um, so when I did the bullfighting female bullfighters project, I thought, well, this is going to have to be film. 
You know, so as my work, it depends on what the project calls for. Um, and I think that, you know, earlier somebody mentioned about, you know, it's getting kind of in this box. It was you talking about being a, you know, a cultural documentarian is my umbrella term now because um, I never wanted to just be just a painter, just a photographer, just a writer. Um, and there's so many different ways we engage with this material and it's really limiting um, in academia, I think, you know, to, to force students into making those decisions. Um, so, as I said, you know, I think the visual studies departments are really challenging this and, uh, and I hope that it inspires other people who are producing work because as you said, we don't fit in those boxes. And so in the real world or where you're gonna get hired, it makes it a little more complicated, but I think we're getting there, yeah. Thank you. Um, I said to start with that these were not representative, but I think I'm wrong, and I'm very happy to believe that the other 297 grants that were given last year would have been equally good, uh, and I hope that convinces you that what we do is absolutely worth it if anyone in this room needs convincing. Um, an extraordinary set of papers uh, that represents uh, not the best, but merely, I will say, an average slice of what it is that we're able to achieve. So please join me in, in thanking our panelists.